Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Inept General, and welcome to our Total War Warhammer 2 Legendary Lord Lore video for Alariel the Ever Queen. Now, at the time of this recording, Alariel hasn't been announced, and I think if Creative Assembly weren't as busy as they were, perhaps we would have seen an Alariel Hellbrun uh, DLC around Valentine's Day. But alas, it looks like we're going to be a bit delayed for that. They have stuff coming out for Rome 2. They have their Britonia thing. They also have the Chinese historical Total War title. So DLC on Total War Warhammer 2 is not nearly as regular or as soon following the release as it was with Total War Warhammer 1. But I think Alaria will be upcoming, probably part of the next DLC. So let's look a bit at her story and where she comes from. So, kicking things off, Alariel the Everqueen, as Everqueens have been since the first Phoenix King, Anarion, appeared, is the daughter of the Everqueen and the Phoenix King. Now, as I understand it, Everqueens did exist before the Phoenix King was a thing. There's always been Everqueens, but they just kind of tied the Phoenix King aspect into producing future Everqueens later on. But there have been Everqueens before there were ever Phoenix Kings. But Lariel herself as a person, not necessarily the Everqueen, was born to the Phoenix King, Bel Hathor, and the Everqueen. Now, I don't think we know the name of the previous Everqueen. If anyone's found that in any official text, do let me know in the comments below. But I don't believe we ever knew Lariel's mother's name. Now, from a very young age, they learned this very early on, the elves, is don't keep the royal family in one place. And the Everqueen and the line of secession for the Everqueens is hugely important because the Everqueen is basically the living avatar of the goddess Isha, which is, for better or worse, essentially the concept of Gaia, Mother Earth, nature itself, and she's the living embodiment of that. And so if she dies, they feel off one, the island itself will die, and really they feel that maybe even like everything will die and the whole world will fade away if the living avatar of the queen of the goddess of nature is completely ruled out so very heavily protected they almost lost the royal family during the great incursion of chaos uh, which we've spoken about a couple of times but the high elves managed to build the vortex and end the first chaos intrusion and thus they managed to save themselves now Durfu over with the wood elves and the tree men managed to save the next ever queen and so the day was saved at the last minute thanks to help of Durfu. and there was a whole compromise there but if you want more details on that story do check out my Durfu law video popping up in the top right hand corner now or you'll find the link in the description below. Anyway, because of that, they have to take basically the toddlers the, away from the mother so that the whole royal family won't be wiped out in one go. So she's been kind of kept separate from both her mother and she had a sister as well. And so she very much had this lonely childhood where she was alone. She never got to spend much time with her mother or her father being the Phoenix King and busy. And so she just kind of felt bad and a bit isolated, really. In Now, fair enough, isolated in a beautiful, almost probably an ivory tower, for lack of a better word. But, you know, she was a sad little rich girl and very sheltered from the realities of the world. Kind of looked after and pampered for most of her life. Now, at some point, she learns of the tragic death of her sister. Now, I'm not exactly sure when this happens, but what she's told is that her sister fell from a tree into a deep river. And she fell into the river and dashed her heads off some rocks now she's very much aware that this is a bit of an odd story but that's what she was told there may be more to it but her sister is dead and so she's the last in the line of the ever queen she spends most of her time as the ever queen's court is in avalon she's also in avalon just not with her mother somewhere else in the let's call it a county shall we uh, or a princedom even avalon very much almost the most naturally attuned uh, high elf princedom so they spend a lot of time with nature they like to bend the wood to form buildings and shapes and stuff not dissimilar to the way wood elves live but with you know more stone structures and stuff involved in there as well so that's kind of the way avalon lived but still very much in tune with nature the way of the wood stuff like that so she grows up sheltered admittedly but learns like how to survive in the woods how to hunt for food you know kind of useful skills like that that isn't really thought of as being like teaching her to be adventurous at all but it's just in avalon considered kind of basic knowledge like walking you have to know how to hunt 
how to make a bow, how to track, stuff like that. You just need to know that if you're growing up in Avalon. So this is really how she spends her days, sort of preparing to be the Ever Queen, being highly educated, you know, having the odd jaunt about the forest. But that's kind of her until she grows up to become a young woman. Now this brings us to the year of the Imperial calendar, 2301. Now, Elle's being very old, I'm not 100% sure when Alariel was exactly born, but this is kind of brings us up to kind of close to current Total War Warhammer timeline for an elf at least. So this is about 200 years before the start of Total War Warhammer. So she's kind of gallivanting around the forest one day and you know, her minders bring her in and sit her down and explain to her, unfortunately, your mother has been killed. She's been poisoned. It was a horrific death, but we have to move quickly. You are going to become the Ever Queen. She is at this point, you know, granted the bodyguards of the Ever Queen, the handmaidens uh, clad in armor. I'm sure she probably had some of them watching her most of her life, but, you know, an extra retinue was brought in, giving the poisoning of the last Ever Queen. So they bring her in, she's coronated, but her body has to undergo the preparation to take in all the power of the Ever Queen. This is probably the most vulnerable point for an Ever Queen. She can't tap into the source of power within herself, being the avatar of the goddess Isha. And so she's really kind of a very weak Ever Queen. So in regards to this, she has the handmaidens to protect her, but also often with the Ever Queen, a protector is assigned. They usually have a competition for this. And so having undergone some of the initial rituals to, let's say, insert the power of Isha into the Ever Queen, by no means complete. She's undergone sort of, let's say, half a dozen of these, maybe even a dozen, but she probably has dozens more, if not even a hundred or so more of these rituals to go before she's fully powered up Ever Queen. And so they go there, like, we need to get her a bodyguard as soon as possible. If the last Ever Queen was murdered, this one needs as much protection as we can possibly afford her. In very much the let's say pompous elven way that even a poisoning won't get you down so let's have a bit of a party out of it and hold a grand tourney and the champion of that tournament will be named the protector of the ever queen now lariel's in shock at this point she doesn't know what's going on it's just chaos her mother's dead she's grieving for that she has now the pressure of the whole elven world upon her shoulders in terms of taking on the mantle of the ever queen very surprisingly overnight she now gets whisked off to this tourney where she has to select a protector champion uh it's just a bit of a roller coaster for her and she's taking it in her stride though you know she has been preparing for this much of her life so she's in shock but kind of surviving like managing to get by um just sort of going along with what she's told really for the most part they go to a point in avalon sort of kind of an open field where they set up the tourney grounds they set up the jousting area they set up the dueling area they build this hugely majestic pavilion for the ever queen and her court to kind of base themselves in while this tournament's going on masses of tents are set up all around the pavilion where each of the contestants and their retinue are sleeping for the night they'll sleep in their individual tents and it's just kind of a bit of a festival all round obviously mourning for the last ever queen but kind of you know the queen is dead long live the queen that type of thing so the first really everyone gets a glimpse of this new ever queen is after the dueling of the first day of the tourney is over there's been sort of certain champions selected the highest ranked have been presented to the ever queens kind of got past their preliminary round uh, they're all kneeling to her as she kind of arrives in their part of the field to kind of inspect her new potential champions. They're everything one might expect from the noblest and grandest warriors of Ulfwan. Really regal, uh, fantastic fighters. But something she's been noticing increasingly is that with the power of the Ever Queen with her, everyone seems to kind of fall over themselves with adoration. They all kind of, it's got to a point where it's like kind of groveling and no one really treated her like this before. And it kind of adds to her aspect of loneliness in her life now no one will ever treat her the same again no one will ever look at her the same way um they'll just all kind of kneel down and be like oh my god have a queen you're amazing you're amazing and uh that's all she's gonna get for the rest of her life so she's a bit put off by this however in the faces of the crowd she notices this one face that seems to be glowering at her now ever since she'd been given the gift of the ever queen no one had sort of glowered at her before and so she kind of made eye contact with 
with this guy, this sort of impudent chap. And, you know, he's a handsome guy. And she catches herself looking a little bit longer than is proper and kind of swiftly averts her gaze. So each of them are presented up, and then she gets to the one who is giving her the stink eye. And yes, it turns out this guy was Prince Tyrion, who earned himself a bit of a reputation reaving along the coast of Nagaroth, and had become known throughout Off One as, you know, a very capable fighter. But he kind of comes up and gives this kind of burlishly, almost rude introduction, so much so that everyone around her, including her handmaidens, all kind of gasp in horror. And the handmaidens all kind of take a step forward because they're like, is this guy actually a threat? What is his deal? It was a bit of an awkward intro. He was came across really rude, effectively, to everyone, including the Everqueen. And this was not on. This is not done in civilized society, being rude to the Everqueen. But anyway, he kind of potters off and she meets the next guy and the next guy. And I think what happens then is that they finish off the dueling for the day and it turns out that Tyrion... Uh, had won the dueling. He became top of the duelist, which was fighting on foot, and that was kind of the end of the first day. The top four, top six, would be invited to dine with the Ever Queen that evening, and that's kind of when she next catches up with everyone. She kind of retires to her pavilion, and so they set up dinner for the pavilion. These kind of glowing, floating lanterns are set up within the pavilion. Minstrels are playing once dinner gets kicked off. It really is a magical and awe-inspiring scene. So come that evening, dinner set up, she's sitting around the table, and she's kind of gets whispers in here. This is really all about her choosing a champion. And so what happens is that the, as boisterous, you know, martially minded men are wont to do, these guys kind of get involved in some verbal jousting, shall we say. And uh, Tyrion, for the most part, seems to be over there. She's still very curious about this man. What is his deal? He's hardly said anything all evening. And he's sitting there. He'll glower at her from time to time. But that's about all she's getting. And so one of the other princes kind of tries to get Tyrion involved in the conversation. He starts to talk about Tyrion. And apparently, by what the Ever Queen had discovered, is that Tyrion had found one of the blades of Anarion, the legendary first Phoenix King, the hero of the Elven people, looked at as kind of a double-edged sword in terms of his darker side uh, that kind of emerged during the Chaos War. But he found this blade, and it's kind of become a bit of a hoopla around the other warriors at dinner. And so they ask him about the story, and they're like, okay, that's enough of that story. What about your, I heard you took your sickly brother with you. And by all accounts, it seems as though Tyrion's brother was somewhat infirm or had some great sickness about him. As a lesser man might have done, Tyrion does not join in the putting down of his brother, but rather repudiates all of the kind of attempted digs at his brother and it really fights for his brother's honor amongst these princes who, it must be said, did not come across well uh, picking on the frailties of another man who, by all rights, was seemingly an extremely powerful and well-learned magic user. So this kind of, you know, tweaks her interest. Like, okay, he's rude, he's abrasive, he seems to have a joy for killing things, apparently, by all accounts, but at least he sticks up for his invalid brother, so that's one positive. You know, there might be potential to him being my protector after all. So dinner goes on, much drinking and merriment is had, and, you know, everyone retires to their tents for the evening for the next day of the tournament. Now, we come to day two of the tournament, and this is the jousting part of the tournament. Now, the jousting goes on, as one might expect, the Everqueen watching over, everyone glaring at her adoringly, and the guys start jousting, they start dehorsing each other, lances are splintered, shields are shattered, uh, it's all a great show all round. One of the last jousts of the day, the semi-final effectively of the jousting part of the tournament, came down to Tyrion and Arhalion. Now, Arhalion was one of the princes who joined in with the berating of the prince the day before and had made it into the kind of last six uh, who were still being considered for the position of the Guardian. Now, he had come, I think, third or fourth in the dueling, and he was about to face off against Tyrion in the jousting. Now, he looked amazing on a horse. He was great with a lance, and indeed, he absolutely thumped the handsome Prince Tyrion. 
uh, knocked him straight off his horse, smack onto his back, and went on to win the whole thing. So having won the jousting, having come sort of third in the dueling, and Tyrion having again kind of done the similar thing in the dueling, um, it really came down to these two. It came down to Tyrion and Arhalion as the front runners for the guardianship of the Everqueen. So these were her two choices now. She had the ill-spoken Tyrion, or for all accounts, the maybe slightly mean-spirited, but equally skilled Arhalion to choose from as her protectors. So this was her choice she was left with as she retired for the second day. So as she's in the pavilion with some of her minders discussing sort of who would make the best choice that evening and sort of how they'd go about it, what the future plans are for the sort of next rituals and everything like that, all the kind of uh, busy work that goes into being the Ever Queen. She can hear the celebrations outside and part of her kind of longs to join in, but she knew it would be a big hoopla if she left the tent. Um, so she's just kind of listening to that and all the warriors are outside, you know, having a drink, sharing a cheer. The tourney's effectively over with those two events done and everyone's just sort of getting ready for the last big celebration before they all leave the next day, one has to assume. Now, over the course of the next few hours, you know, as she kind of retires for the evening, ponders, discusses, and meets with various attendants, the celebration noises start to take a bit of a stranger hue to them. They start to uh, have the odd clattering of steel and the odd sort of noise. And then I think in the night she hears a scream and she's like, my God, what are they doing out there? And suddenly there's a commotion at the front of her tent. She's not exactly sure what's happening. Then the screaming is louder. This is sounds of battle. This is fighting. She has no idea what's going on. She sees one of her handmaidens rush towards her to try and protect her, only to take an arrow in the back of the head and collapse on the floor in front of her. Behind her are a group of ten druki, dark elves. How did they get to the heart of Avalon? This was an impossibility. What was happening here? She was unarmed, helpless, and even if she did have a weapon, she barely knew how to use one. And so, she is struck about the face by what appears to be the general of the Druki. She is tied up and gagged, and he almost triumphantly starts to rest a foot on top of her, in a very disrespectful fashion, but she is just terrified, almost frozen with fear at what is going on. This is the end. If the Witch King manages to get his hands on her, my god, what will happen to Ulfwan? What will happen to her people? And she's just in total shock at what is going on. Now, after a while, the Druki begin to discuss amongst themselves the plans. They begin to revel in what appears to be a victory for them, with her bound and gagged on the floor. As they were reveling and taking their time, discussing their future plans and what they were going to do, a messenger comes in, and almost in the flash of an eye, a blade erupts from its scabbard, bursting with flame, and slices off the face of the closest Druki. It swings round, cuts through the midsection of the sorcerer standing next to him, and then proceeds to cut apart every Druki close to the messenger. She, seeing an opportunity, quickly rolls away from under the foot of the Druki general, so quickly, in fact, that she manages to unbalance him, and he falls flat on his back. In an attempt to sort of get back up, he too is struck down by this flaming sword. She is terrified. Is this a friend or a foe? When suddenly she looks up and she recognizes the face of Tyrion. Prince Tyrion? None other. Come with me if you want to live. He unbound her and took the gag out. He sort of signaled to her to wait there. He went back out to the front and said, Quickly, run after him, get him! She could hear the footsteps of the Druki guard leaving the front of the pavilion. They weren't going out that way. That was a mere distraction, it seemed, as Tyrion cut a hole in the back of the pavilion and the two of them ran out into the night, making their way for the tree line for the forests of Avalon. As she saw the tent city around the pavilion burning, heard the scream of her fellow high elves being tortured and raped she just was overwhelmed with this sense of shock that had taken her over ever since she'd seen Druki enter her tent this is hopeless she said Tyrion holding her hand and charging her forward into the forest of Avalon turns to her and says it's not hopeless as long as you are alive my ever queen and she takes some comfort in this although she's not entirely sure Tyrion believes that himself at one point they come across the corpse of another Druki Tyrion goes past it and then stops them for a second he goes 
we need to change you into this. Him already being disguised in the armor of a Druki soldier, we need to get you disguised as well. If anyone sees you, even from a distance, it's very obvious who you are. So they place the armor of another Druki soldier on the Ever Queen, and the two of them in disguise continue to try and escape what had just become a killing field. And so they continue moving through the night. They get to the woodland, they make the tree line, and begin to think they've made it away. They might survive this night of terror. From the dense tree line, they suddenly kind of emerged out into this clearing. Now, on the other end of the clearing, which must have been sort of a hundred yards or so, they see some figures, and it becomes quickly apparent what these figures are, and it's too late. They've already been spotted. Their best bet is just to try and pass by casually as dark elf warriors. Now, as they get closer, they begin to make out what the figures are in the darkness of the night. And they are none other than witch elves, the fanatics of the Druki, some of their most dangerous soldiers. And so Tyrion attempts to talk his way out of it, but even she can tell that his accent isn't going to fool anyone. They begin to move around the two of them, and indeed Tyrion notices this movement, withdraws his sword again, bursting into flame as he withdrew it from its scabbard, and he started to attack the Witch Elves. Now, these were much trickier than the Druki he had fought before. They moved with almost unbelievable swiftness. She was just completely helpless. She couldn't do anything. She just tried to avoid the trouble, get out of the way. Now, Tyrion managed to cut down one, two Witch Elves, and then suddenly, one of them started to make a move towards her. She noticed this. However, Tyrion was quick to respond, cutting down that Witch Elf, but taking a knife in the side for his pains. Now he got closer to her, holding her behind him in an effort to protect the witch elves who had obviously seen the weak point of his defense by not attacking him but by trying to kill her. This made it infinitely more difficult for him and she was just completely terrified as blades swished past her head, past her torso. She felt she was surely to be stabbed but each time Tyrion moved her or parried away the blade with his own, cutting down a, wi a witch elf almost with every defensive stroke. And before she knew it, they had all been struck down. Tyrion was a victor again, but he was in a lot of pain, having taken a blade to the side. Now, she went to see if she could tend to the wound with her limited powers in terms of healing at this moment, uh, but there's not much she can do for him, and the two of them just have to keep moving. Now, being a witch elf blade, they suspect that the blade is poisoned, but they don't know yet. So they go and they continue on their travels into the evening, just trying to get as far away from the burning pavilion as they can. With the death of the witch elves, they seem to have escaped the immediate perimeter of the Dark Elf army, making their way further, probably further eastward at this point, as it had been the way they'd escaped out of Avalon. And so they're making their way in the evening underneath the sort of starry night, and they begin to kind of talk amongst one another, and she says, you seem to have a gift for violence, uh, Prince Tyrion. And he's like, yes, it's kind of the only thing I've ever really been good at. Uh, she says, oh, she kind of whispers under her breath, blood of Anarian. Now, this is kind of a cursed word that the idea that Anarian was cursed ever since he withdrew a blade from the shrine of Cain and his blood has never really recovered. It's said to curse his whole line. Now, technically, both of them are descendants from Anarian. They're probably like, I don't know, second cousins removed or something like that. Um, but, but they are related. Um, so... It's a bit weird, but there we go. Anyway, put that aside. Now, she very much saw it as, oh, he has the gift for killing, which might have him fall prey later on to going the way Anarian did. Now, although he's a great hero, he's also kind of a figure of tragedy almost in the way that he became so uh, crazed with battle and bloodlust. Uh, so it's kind of an insult to him, although they are both kind of related to the same dude. But it's just a way that she looks upon him, not hugely fondly. It's something that she sees as a personality defect, his ability to kill so easily, it seems. So they kind of continue on their walk, not really getting along, but he's still trying to save the Ever Queen. She's the bastion, the pope of their people, really, and kind of has an actual real effect on the world, I believe, as well. So they kind of go along, and suddenly she shouts out, Aha! And he's like, What the fuck? What is something on? What is it? Witch elves? What's up? And she's like, just jumps up into this tree, and then comes down with this branch. And he's like, What is that? What are you doing? 
Why would you shout, aha? We're literally trying to bloody sneak away from murdering dark elves and you're just making noise in the woods. And she starts to go like, I can make a bow out of this. I can finally get a weapon. And she kind of fashions it, fashions this bit of wood into a bow, gets some fabric, some like wood or reed or something and makes that into the string. And you know, before you know it, a couple of hours passes, they kind of make camp and rest for a little bit, for an evening even. Um, while trying to escape the Dark Elves, makes his bow, shoots down a couple of birds, uses that to make sort of arrow uh, fletching, uh, and then just continues on. So now she has a bow on her, and it seems she might actually be pretty good at this. Now her never considering herself one for martial skill, hadn't really realized that just growing up in Avalon, she you know, developed a good adeptness with a bow, and was a pretty bloody sharp shot at it as well. So... Now she's armed and can be a bit more helpful. And it's really kind of a moment of empowerment for her. She finds this bow. She's like, this is something I know I can do. I can shoot an arrow. I can kill a thing. And if we're fighting for our lives, I'm not going to have that feeling of helplessness I had when those dark elves came into my tent. I'm going to stick up for myself and I'm going to fight next time. Kind of an internal vow she takes to herself. So now with the bow, with a couple of birds, maybe to eat some of the meat from them, uh, they make camp and they're sitting around the campfire at night and the Ever Queen is just sort of, kind of just chirps up all of a sudden after they've been silent for a little while. You don't like me, do you? Kind of referring to the earlier incident at the tawny grounds where he gave her the evil eye and was a bit rude. And uh, he just kind of says, it's not that I don't like you. It's that I don't like what was going on when you arrived at the tawny grounds. Everyone just immediately kind of bent the knee and looked upon you with adoration. But I could feel there was some kind of weird magic at work. And she chirps up and was like, I wish I wasn't possessed by this thing. And he's like, that's an interesting choice of words, the words possessed. And she just chirps up, that's how it feels to her. Like something's inside her body, something that she doesn't necessarily have full control over. And uh, she doesn't really like it. And it's not her fault. It's kind of something she can't control. This aura of adoration when people bend the knee. And she found it strange that he was able to resist it. Not being particularly sensitive to magic. Or being able to necessarily repel it by any kind of normal means. So they kind of chat about that for a while. And eventually he just goes, you know what, what does it matter? You don't like me either. She says it's very hard to like someone who's this openly hostile. Now I think openly hostile is a bit uh, of an exaggeration. He was mildly rude. But, you know, there we go. For someone who hadn't been mildly, who no one's ever been mildly rude to, I can see how you might interpret that as fairly hostile. In an effort to change the subject, starts to ask about his family and what's going on with him, and ask about his brother and his mother, and he explains that his mother died during childbirth. But at that point, she knows she's touched a nerve because she just gets up and leaves the campfire. And so she kind of settles off to sleep for that first evening on the run from the Dark Elves, who had somehow, inexplicably made it into the heart of Ulfwan. Suddenly, in the night, she hears a high-pitched screech, and Tyrion, who must have come back from when he left the campfire, is sitting bolt up right next to her. He knows what that is. Grab your stuff, he says. We need to go now. And they start to run. And she's like, what is that? What's that noise? And he just turns around to her and says, cold ones. Now, for those of you who don't necessarily know, cold ones are essentially velociraptors that the Dark Elves use as mounts. So they are hunting them through the woods on the backs of velociraptors. So they are running. They are running through the wood. And he explains to her, we need to move. She's like, it sounds quite far off. It's like, it doesn't matter. Once they catch our scent, we're done. They can catch the scent of blood from up to a mile away. We need to keep running. And so they gather all their belongings and they just start to go. And they're running and running and running. And so this goes on for most of the day. They keep, keep running. They hear the screeches either to their left or to their right from further behind them. But they're definitely getting closer. They're not sure if they've caught their scent or not. And so they know they're being hunted. They're just not sure if they're, if they're kind of caught. Uh, so at some point they get to this clearing. Now at that point the other queen kind of is looking around to see if any sort of threats are about. Uh, but she can't spot anything. And she suddenly feels Tyrion's hand on her shoulder. And he just pushes her now she lands in a bush now she knows better than to scream out but she's trying to figure out why the hell he just pushed it in the bush and sees him disappear behind kind of a tree into some shrubbery himself and it's at that point that she notices what he noticed and that there was a complete silence around the wood there was no birds singing or chirping at all and several druki emerged into the clearing she could see them moving they seemed to be moving strangely much in the way she'd seen kind of cats uh, when they're uh, stalking and they were kind of moving that way through the undergrowth and they 
stand exactly where Tyrion and the other queen entered the clearing and it seems they have spotted their tracks. She knows this is it. She was not going to be as powerless as she was that time in the pavilion. She knocked her bow, stood up from the bush and loosed the first arrow with almost lightning quick speed. The arrow shot straight into the eye of the first scout. The scout at the back of the group suddenly took a flaming blade through the middle of his chest. Tyrion had emerged behind the scouting part and began to cut them down one by one, cutting through a crossbow, cutting through the flesh of another Drew Key, moving on, one, two, three, dropped. Now, at this point, the fourth had got a slide of sight on him with a crossbow, almost ready to loose point blank. She knocked another arrow by this point and let loose, this one going straight into the throat of the fourth Drew Key as the bolt aimed squarely at Tyrion's head, missed by an inch, narrowly whizzing past his right-hand side as the last of the scouting party fell. He looked up at her and simply said, Thank you, you saved my life. The commotion that that brief scuffle had made had alerted every Drukey hunting party around them, and each of them started to blow their hunting horns, knowing that they'd been caught. Now, there was only one thing left to do, run. So as they run through the undergrowth, they start to hear Dark Elf war cries from their left-hand side, from their right-hand side, from behind them. Bolts are whizzing by them. Tyrion starts to take up this very weird and elongated zigzag pattern, obviously trying to dodge bolter bows. But he looked like a child in the wood. Did he not know how to run through a woodland properly on the fire? Something she'd obviously picked up somewhere. And she was doing a much more intricate weaving thing, using the trees themselves for cover. And he seemed to see what she was doing. Doing and copy likewise and as they started to make their way out of the wood. The screeches of the cold one were much nearer now, almost directly behind them, and as they burst out into a clearing, they started to sprint across the field, and as they were about halfway around through this field with kind of intermittent trees, they saw from the solid tree line break out three cold ones with their riders, and they were caught. Now, she knows where she's going. Tyrion doesn't. As she notices from the corner of her eye behind her that Tyrion starts to turn around, she stops him. She grabs him and says, run, you idiot. She knows where they are. There is still hope. They can make it. So they start to sprint across the last part of the field. Now, as they approach one of the trees in this field, she can see the cold ones are right behind them. They're too close. Even she knows they can't make it now. So she jumps up, grabs a branch, and flings herself up into this tree. Tyrion doesn't he just keeps running and she's like okay i hope he can look after himself she can see him from the ground she he turns draws sunfang his blade just as the first cold one is bearing down on him he deftly dodges to one side of it and cuts it across the thigh of its leg bringing the cold one down he then slices open the leg of the druki riding it and the cold one seems to try and like feast on the druki on top of him uh keeping the two of them busy there are two more cold one riders now so the second cold one is bearing down on Tyrion now. She's managed to knock an arrow and lets loose. It hits this guy straight in the visor and the rider falls down, collapsing the cold one he's on top of. Next is the other one. She can't get an arrow in time. It's gonna get at Tyrion. This is it. She's going to have to watch him die. But he holds up his sword. She can't understand what he's doing. And he holds up the sword and suddenly a fireball emerges from the end of his sword. Now, Alariel is just completely shocked by this. I thought he couldn't use any kind of magic. And it just burst the cold one and its rider into flame. She gets down from the tree and starts running for what she knows is a river. And she's like, Tyrion, come on, we have to go, as more cold ones burst out from the tree line behind them. So they get to the river that Ilario was aiming for. It's hugely wide and is moving incredibly fast. They have no hope of kind of swimming across. And she's like, don't worry, I used to do this as a girl. There's a better way than swimming across. And she points at the trees lining the riverbank. And they're all kind of huge, weeping willow-like trees with massive, thick vines around them and she's like we can make it across so they climb up this tree Tyrion seems to be in huge amounts of pain at this point from the wound he'd taken from the witch elf blade and really struggles to get up into this tree as Ilariel has to help hoist him up into its branches she goes first she grabs some of the vines and starts to swing across Tarzan style across this massively wide lake with these overhanging trees the dark elves are too far away to see what these guys are doing and so she makes it across and waits for Tyrion to come. Once she starts to get a glimpse of him making his way across the river, she can see him grimacing. He seems to be in even more pain now, and sure enough, the pain seems to get the better of him as he loses his grip and falls tumbling down into the river below. 
Now, that could be the end for him, she's sure, but she has an inkling in her mind that he's probably survived. So she sneaks out from the trees across the river and kind of disappears into the forest on the other side. Now, the Druki arrive at the riverbank and don't know where they've gone. They thought they'd managed to corner them against this river. It'd be far too dangerous for anyone to try and swim across. But they can't find them, and they sort of say, well, we need to get back on this hunt. She's not around for this, so Ilariel makes her way into the forest, and she knows that if Tyrion is alive, he would have been washed down river. So she starts to make her way in that direction to try and fish him out of the riverbank if he survived at all. Now, it takes her most of the day of searching. She has no clue, and over time, she starts to notice that some Druki parties, not as much as the whole kind of hunting party they were facing before, but some have made it across the river and in the woods with her but she's managing to evade them come nightfall through the woods she hears a commotion like uh, this cries and screams of battle and she kind of heads towards it thinking if anyone's fighting i'm pretty sure i know who it is now in my opinion that's a bit of a hard jump because it's just as likely the druki were murdering and raping each other as it was anything else going on but lo and behold she arrives to find a slaughtered camp of dark elves and just Tyrion standing there kind of allowing cold ones to feed on the bodies of their riders um, as she arrives. And she's kind of appalled by this, being like, could you, like, do you know any other way but just murdering everything? Despite the fact, you know, hey, he's helping her out of this situation, but she's still on him about this thing. It's kind of one of their biggest sort of divisive areas. So they're reunited across the river, and they start to go, okay, we need to keep moving. We need to just keep moving east. We'll get out of here. We'll get out of the reach of these dark elves eventually. They find a huge oak tree, and knowing what she knows about the woodland, uh, the Ever Queen says, let's go, uh, let's go up here. We can sleep in the nooks of these trees. Um, they make very comfortable sort of camping uh, beds, really. And so they go and sleep in a tree and they start to talk amongst themselves. She's like, I didn't know you could use magic. He's like, that I don't think was magic, but I didn't even know my sword could do that. Uh, referring to the fireball earlier on. And uh, so she kind of goes through that. And they're like, okay, this tree will hide our scent. We're kind of sheltered from the wind. Uh, we should be all right on that front. And he's like, what, they use magic? She was hoping he wouldn't ask this question because in her mind, she knew she didn't have the capability yet to use any kind of magic to hide them from magical means of tracking them. And she kind of confesses this to him and explains a little bit about how she doesn't know how to yet, how she's only really a partial ever queen, if that. She hasn't undergone the majority of the rituals she needs to undergo to prepare her body for the amount of magical energy she'll channel eventually. And uh, so she can't really do anything about magic tracking, despite the fact that historically the Ever Queen is one of the most powerful magic users within the Elven Kingdom, if not the most. So he's a bit taken aback by this. He's like, oh, I didn't know it worked that way. And, uh, you know, his naivety, his naive innocence, handsomeness is starting to win her over slightly, despite his uh, penchant for murdering at any given site. Well, not really murdering, battling, let's say. So the two of them fall asleep in the kind of arms of this old ancient oak tree, and they get up the next day and like, okay, well, let's just keep moving, keep plowing through the forest, we'll escape eventually. Now, going through the woodland, Ilariel starts to have an idea that these trees look familiar to her, she might actually know where she is. And eventually kind of this wave of recognition envelops and she's like, I know exactly where we are. Come with me, Tyrion. Kind of drags him, grabs his arm. And is like, we are near the Winterwood Palace. This is where I spent a lot of time here as a girl. We'll find shelter. We'll find supplies. We might even find help. Um, this, so let's go, let's go quickly. Now, the Winterwood Palace, which is this wonderful uh, palace built entirely of living wood. And it's like the elves have molded the wood to grow in the shapes they want it to grow in. And it's formed this kind of huge winter palace that I believe is underground, unless I'm mistaken. All kind of like partly underground, something like that. And um, so they get to this palace of living wood and it's just completely majestic. And she talks to uh, Tyrion because uh, Alariel had grown up, spent a lot of time there as a girl. And she knew the way the place quite intimately. Now, the Winter Wood Palace is really just a place for them to go during winter that are particularly harsh. When the wood won't necessarily support them, they all need to hunker down and keep warm. 
is effectively the, what this place is built for. Now, it's not currently winter, and so the place is, rel is just abandoned, really. No one's in there. They arrive. It's empty. And they say, okay, well, look, we can stay here for a bit, but then we need to keep moving. Now, Tyrion at this stage is struggling to even walk at a brisk pace. The poison wound he'd sustained is just getting worse and worse and worse. And as they're searching the Winter Palace, he just collapses. He passes out. Elariel kind of drags him into one of the rooms and sort of sets him up on a bed um, and begins to kind of try and nurse him, do what she can for the wound. Now, she starts to have a look around while he's kind of resting up and asleep, and she finds a bow and arrows that are proper arrows and a proper bow as opposed to the homemade one she had earlier she also finds this staff and it's she recognizes it from when she was a kid and it's the moon staff of Lilia so she grabs that she's like I can maybe hopefully make use of this and uh, so sets about and starts to look after him now Tyrion sometimes wakes up and he's just completely out of it he's having fever dreams and at some point he gets violence towards her he grabs her he shoves her about the place um he's just talking nonsense and uh you know she starts to get bruises on her arms from a couple of these fits but every time he kind of passes back out again and ends up resting up it's not until three days later that he actually makes any kind of sense and wakes up in any kind of coherent form she explains to him what's been going on and she'd even gone out to have a look around to make sure that the druki weren't hot on their heels and it seemed all clear he got kind of mad at her for going outside he's like you shouldn't risk yourself like that she's like look buddy boy you were just out of it having bloody fits convulsions like i'm just trying to get us better i'm trying to i had to look out for myself a little bit and uh, she kind of shows him the bruises, and he apologizes, and as many women do, she was like, oh, it's not your fault, I'm sure it's my fault, or whatever. So, despite the fact this was the time he was most coherent, he starts to drift off, and, uh, you know, she's like, okay, look, you need to rest still. And she starts to sing him a beautiful elven lullaby. And he starts to doze off and fall asleep. And before she knows it, she's entranced by her own lullaby and falls asleep right next to him. Very sweet, isn't it? She's woken violently, with a hand on her mouth, being shaken quite viciously. And she realizes, once she actually gets her bloody eyesight back in focus, that it's Tyrion's hand on her mouth, and she doesn't know what's been going on. And he whispers in her ear, we've been discovered. And so they get up, they get out of bed, they put on their stuff, and as they make their way out of the bedchamber, a bolt kind of whizzes past Tyrion's head and embeds itself in the doorframe. He pulls her back into the room, and there's already Druki in there. So they pull back into the room, and they try to set up an ambush. The Druki, very stupidly, as all henchmen tend to do, just came into the room after them. Tyrion promptly cut them down. She maybe shot one with an arrow, but they bolted out of the room after they cut down that initial group. But there were dark elves here. They'd made it to the Winterwood Palace. And so they're trying to find their way out. She knows kind of a secret-ish way out, and they make their way there, um, all the while knowing that there are dark elves in the palace hunting them down through the corridors. So they make it to this, what looks like a wall, really. And she puts her hand on the wall, the Ever Queen, and whispers some words to the wood. And the wood kind of opens up, and allows them to escape out of what is effectively a back door. Now, as they're sort of leaving the back door, they do it very cautiously, and almost immediately a bolt flies at them and kind of lands straight at one of their feet. Now, Lariel is the quickest to react, quicker than Tyrion even, and she whips out an arrow and fires it into the bush where she saw the arrow come from, only to hear a scream from a dark elf. Wah! And that alerts every dark elf around them, and they are back on the run. So they just sprint for the undergrowth, trying to hide themselves, and that's what they're doing. They know that the Dark Elves have the jump on them. They're probably all around them. So Tyrion and her find a decent enough shrubbery to hide in. And they kind of get pulled down. They hide in the shrubbery. And they're just hunkering down. Now, they are too close to each other to be able to get out their weapons. If they're found now, they are dead dead and so they're kind of huddled together just hoping that they will not be discovered now at this point she kind of notices just how close they are and they're just like they're on top of each other they are either spooning or like front legs interlocked and it's a very intimate moment so much so they kind of like you know a flush overcomes her slightly and they're so close she can feel his heart beating through his chest and through his armor that's just kind of like how intertwined they are in this very tight hiding place so they managed to crawl out from the undergrowth and the the dark Dark Elves are kind of spread out, knowing they've left the Winter Palace looking for them. They manage to sneak through their lines and end up heading in a direction that Tyrion is the first comment. It's kind of like, what's that smell? Now, she knows where they're going. Her idea is we have to go somewhere they would not be maybe willing to follow or would not enjoy following us. 
And so she is taking Tyrion to an area of Avalon known as the Dark Wood. Now this is an area that has been forever corrupted by chaos ever since the first invasion. To Ilariel, the Dark Woods were a vile, disgusting place. The trees oozed pus, they looked rotten to the core, and it smelt horribly. The Dark Woods had been tainted by chaos ever since the first incursion of chaos onto Old Juan and had never recovered. This was a place that offended her to her soul, but it was the only choice they had left. The Druki had cut off any other means of escape other than through this wood, and so this was the way they'd have to go. So once they started to wade through the dark wood, it's at that point that Tyrion simply chirped up with, It's not that bad. I'm not saying I'd build a summer home here, but the trees are quite lovely. I'm not saying I'd build a su not, I'm not saying I'd build a summer home here, but the trees are quite lovely. She she reacted with shock and silence at this response from Tyrion, as this to her was the vilest place in Avalon and a stain on the beauty of all of Ulthwan. So they began to keep moving. She was able to guide them using what markers rangers had left behind as everyone who wasn't a ranger tried to avoid the dark wood. Now rangers would come in here trying to stop people stealing ingredients they'd use in dark rituals and they also would hunt down some monsters that would venture outside of the dark wood sometimes then go back to their home territory just to negate any threat and many mutinous monsters had emerged from this horrible place. Now at this point she decided to address Tyrion for they had been being stalked for the last couple of hours as they made their way through the dark wood. It's a manticore she said. He said I knew we were being tracked by something but a manticore really? She's like I know what a manticore looks like. And so Tyrion asked, why, asked her why hadn't it attacked. Thinking about it I'm not entirely sure why. Manticores can be unpredictable but it probably waited for us to make camp before taking us. And so eventually they did have to make camp after a few hours, all the while hearing the snaps of the twigs, the rustling noises, the kind of low growl from afar that the manticore made as it stalked them through the dark wood. And exactly as Lariel had predicted, the manticore pounced on them as soon as they'd settled down for camp. This point, Tyrion, who'd been trying to figure out how he'd launched his fireball from his sword the first time round, simply stood up and gave it one almighty uh, sort of scream as a fireball emerged from the end of his sword and launched itself at the manticore. Now, it just missed the manticore and kind of exploded in a flame and set some of the manticore's fur on fire as it ran back into the woods, hopefully scared off for the night. And so they resumed to making camp and settling in for a night in one of the most horrific places the Ever Queen could imagine. However, even as they began to settle down, they saw four strangers on the path behind them approaching. They were obviously Druki. One armed with a bow, one with an axe, one was unarmed, and he seemed to emit this magical aura around him, and another female who had daggers around her sides. Now, this point, they know what these Dark Elves are after. They're after them, and they've caught them. So what is going to happen? They start to square up, they start to talk a little bit, they ask who the elves are, um, and Tyrion replies with his name. He'd built up a reputation even amongst the Dark Elves with his reaving along their coast. And so it seemed that the Dark Elves did not know who the Ever Queen had escaped with, and they'd finally figured out it was Tyrion with him telling them. So at this point, we have a kind of medieval Mexican standoff with everyone's hands on their blades, but no one's drawn anything yet. And at that very moment, the manticore leaps out from behind the mound and starts to charge towards the camp. The dark elf, the bow, reacts the quickest, loosing one of the arrows straight into the manticore's eyes. Tyrion sees his chance as previously the bowman had had an arrow pointed squarely at his head. Charges up Sunfang, unleashing another fireball towards the bowman, just as he loses another arrow but Tyrion was already on the move and the arrow missed. The fireball exploded kind of directly in front of the bowman setting all of his clothes aflame as he ran screaming away from his previous position. The unarmed dark elf seemingly being a mage fired a lightning bolt straight at Tyrion which he also just narrowly managed to avoid and knowing he couldn't close the distance between the time the elf fired off that lightning bolt and his next spell Tyrion simply threw Sunfang which embedded itself 
himself in the chest of the mage and he collapsed dead on the ground. Now, Alariel, seeing that she had her own problems to deal with, saw the female dark elf with the daggers coming straight at her. She whispered some magical words into the wood around her, using the living roots to completely entangle this charging dark elf warrior and he she managed to pin her down the dark elf had an arm free grabbed one of his daggers and threw it straight at the ever queen with the hilt hitting her straight in the head and that was the last the ever queen knew of it now for most of this story i've tried to stick with the perspective of the ever queen so really from her perspective she's passed out after this having been hit in the head with a dagger intentionally presumably because the dark elves wanted her alive but she's knocked out but you know this is a pretty good battle so we're just going to keep going so, the hilt hits the Ever Queen in the head, knocks her out. Tyrion, charging towards her to try and protect her, sees that the Dark Elf is trying to throw a second dagger at him. Now, time seems to slow, and he's not sure if this is the influence of the Ever Queen or what happens, or just his lightning reaction, but he manages to pluck the dagger out of the air and throw it back at the assassin female Dark Elf, and it hits her straight in the eye, killing the Dark Elf female. Now, the spell that the Ever Queen had laid down before had also managed to entangle the huge Dark Elf with the axe, but he had managed to cut himself free at that point. Now, it's just him versus Tyrion. He swings his axe, Tyrion manages to narrowly avoid it, but the pain in his side from the witch elf wound still bothers him. He's not recovered, he's not really getting better, it's just getting worse and worse, and he just narrowly manages to avoid the first swing. Tyrion managed to roll behind the dark elf and kind of strike out at him, but he knew, he noticed that the dark elf's skin seemed to be made of something else. It was literally as hard as rock. Now, Tyrion had to think of a way to get round this seemingly impenetrable defense of stone skin, so he had to aim for bits of the flesh that were probably still like supple and moving and so he manages to sort of whip behind the dark elf again smack him in the back of the knee bringing the elf down and then he brought a knee straight into the dark elf's windpipe hoping that the crushed windpipe would suffocate this dark elf whose skin had been hardened in certain points but the dark elf got up grabbed his axe and started to charge at Tyrion again now Tyrion thought he was free and clear having crushed his throat knowing it's just a matter of time before he suffocates but the dark Dark Elf surprises him and cuts a line in his own throat so that he could breathe. He gives himself a, a self-made tracheotomy, I believe it is. And the Dark Elf starts to breathe out of this self-made hole and continues to charge towards Tyrion. So Tyrion is just like in pain, he can't really move, and the Dark Elf swings it one more. Tyrion stumbles, he falls, and the Dark Elf is lifting up with one more swing to bring the fatal blow to Tyrion, and Tyrion, with the last of his will, manages to sort of just about dodge it, and he's just in such agonizing pain, he's literally about to pass out, and he moment grab Sunfang which is now he's managed to get himself in the position where he's right next to the corpse of the mage pull it out of the mage's chest and stab it into the point where the dark elf had cut his own throat thus a weak point in the skin killing the final dark elf and he manages to crawl over to where Alaria was and simply collapses passing out now Alariel awoke, sort of managed to kind of get Tyrion up and to his feet eventually, and they made their way out of the Dark Woods, seemingly out of the last of the immediate danger of the Dark Elves. And they started to make their way into more, the healthy woods of Avalon again, beyond the Dark Wood. Um, and you, we kind of pick up the story with them a few days later once they'd been traveling for a little bit. So a few days later, they start to find themselves towards the eastern edge of Avalon. Uh, still not found any aid, still on the run, but they haven't seen Hyde nor Hera being hunted for a little while yet. They think they may be free and clear. But Tyrion has been getting much worse. The poison is really just ripping him apart. Alariel is at the end of her tether. She doesn't know what to do. And so she considers to herself... I have to pull out the last stop. I have to tap into the power within me to see if there's anything I can do to keep this man alive. This man who saved my life, whose life I've saved almost seemingly countless times now. So let's see what we can do. And so she taps into the Ever Queen power within herself and she changes. She kind of like takes a back seat in her own body as all the minds of all the Ever Queens who ever lived start to emerge and start to converse with Tyrion. They start to tell him that 
this host isn't ready yet for the full power of the Ever Queen, and he asks if that she can do anything about the wound, and the Ever Queens reply that they can, and so with the limited potential of the host as it is at the moment, they do their best of magic to try and heal him, and it makes it a little bit better so that he can at least get up and move again, but it doesn't cure it entirely. Uh, so they are pulled back, they're like, with this, this is the best we can do with the body in its current state, as it currently has. It can't channel enough of our power to heal you properly. And so she kind of then passes out. She eventually wakes up, so kind of next to Tyrion, he's like, what was that? He tries to the next place, she's like, I have to tap in to the power of Isha within myself. And in so doing, I tapped into all the knowledge of all the previous Ever Queens to see if they could keep you alive. And it seems that they managed to. So Alariel, having tapped into this power, kind of talks to Tyrion about it. And she says it, it doesn't feel good when she did it this time. It felt almost like herself was drowning away and there wouldn't be much of Alariel left, just the Ever Queen, if she did it for much longer. But, you know, it was okay. Uh, and she will get better at it with time. And they get into a discussion about the Ever Queen and what that exactly means for her as a person versus her as the Ever Queen. And she says, that's why I kind of liked the look of the stain you gave me when we first met. Um, it was because if you didn't look at me with adoration, you may be one of the last people who ever look at me to see me for Ilariel, who won't see me for the Ever Queen. Because um, you can see through that magical aura and you see me just as a person. And he sort of says, well, yeah, I suppose I do. And I think I like the person more than I like the Ever Queen. The Ever Queen's the thing that makes me uncomfortable. I actually quite like Lariel. And they kind of make peace and they're getting a bit closer. And, and they get so close, in fact, that she realizes they're close enough to kiss. And in her mind, it plays out that she wouldn't mind that terribly much. And then suddenly he stops. He pulls away. And he just turns to her and says, hide, quickly. Now, the Ever Queen hasn't noticed anything at this stage, so she kind of stands up, and he stands up, but he can still barely stand. The Ever Queen managed to heal him a little bit, but, like, nowhere near his full strength, just enough to kind of keep walking. But in terms of him gripping his sword, he's kind of just swaying there, having barely recovered from the magic she used on him. And so as they stand around the campfire, uh, Tyrion thinks, like, there's something moving out there in the wood, and he begins to grab uh, bits of wood from the fireplace and throws them into the wood around him. So they quickly become kind of uh, encircled by this ring of fire all around them as they see a huge dark shadow darting around from side to side. They know something's there, they just don't know what it is. And Tyrion is scared, and it's the first time she's really seen Tyrion scared, and she's not sure why, but that fear kind of took hold of her as well. She held on to her staff so tightly, her knuckles turned white. And so she starts to turn, and even this moment of fear, she asks him almost out of nervousness, out of uh, just maybe almost hopelessness, and to try and put her mind onto something else. She just asks Tyrion, in this moment of all moments, if we get out of this, what do you hope to do? And it's almost a farewell. She almost knows that whatever this is stalking them, it might be the end of them both. Uh, they've gone without aid because the Dark Elf army had not only invaded Avalon but was invading the whole of Ulfwan and they'd chosen this moment because the Ever Queen was at her weakest to invade the whole of the country and they were fighting a war which the High Elves were losing so no aid was coming anytime soon and this threat this huge monstrous threat in the wood uh, might be the end of them so she asks this question even catching herself thinking how silly it is to ask it and uh, he just turns to her and says we started this together, we're going to end it together. And he holds her hands and pulls her close, and at that moment she realized that, unlike before where she wouldn't mind kissing him, she wanted to kiss him. They suddenly hear this voice from the wood around him that goes, That you most assuredly will. I will see to it. And out of the wood, Inkari, the demon who had haunted Tyrion when he was a child, uh, who had tried to kill him, whom him and his brother had managed to cast back into the warp out of kind of sheer luck, and with the intervention of the power of Asurian, had managed to cast him out after Inkari had vowed to himself to wipe out the line of Anarian. And here he had both Tyrion and the Ever Queen, two of Anarian's descendants. And this is how ancient Inkari is. But Tyrion recognizes this monstrosity and tells her to run. Now, what Tyrion notices on Inkari is that he's covered in chains. He wasn't covered in chains when they bumped into each other when Tyrion was young. And he asks, are you enslaved, Inkari? And suddenly he has a revelation that this is how the Dark Elves have been doing it. The Dark Elves managed to move within the heart of Avalon itself without any High Elf armies intercepting 
them, completely destroying their sort of fort, their pavilion, the tawny, all the warriors there, because they had the help of a greater demon of Slanesh. This is how this was their key to the battle they were fighting. But he realized almost too late, and he then tells her again, run, I will hold him off. She hasn't moved, and she simply turns to him and says, I'm not going anywhere. So the two of them face off against Ankari, this greater demon. Tyrion lunges at him with almost a kind of pathetic groan, just from the sheer effort of doing it. Ankari parried away his strike, and she summoned up what magical energy she could, which was very limited at this point, and cast it at the greater demon, to which he just gestured some kind of counter spell and undid her spell. Pitiful, he said. Tyrion lunged again, this time towards Nkari's groin. He hit the sword away and then just smacked Tyrion, who went flying through the air and crashed into a nearby tree, collapsing on the ground in a heap. Trying desperately to get himself up, Alariel could see the effort he was putting in, but the wound and that strike was just too much. He was unable to move. Now, it was just her and the greater demon. This is how the Everqueen would meet her end. And so she made peace closed her eyes, waiting for the inevitable fatal blow, when suddenly she just hears a crack out of the wood. Bolt of magical energy strikes Nkari in the side, setting him ablaze with flame and lightning. Nkari starts to scream, and out of the woodland emerges an elf, clad in what she recognized from her internal knowledge of the Everqueen as the crown of Safari. It seems I have your attention. Leave now, and I will spare you, said the stranger to Nkari the greater demon still screaming and writhing in pain from the magical damage it had taken from the stranger's last attack. They seemed to share some recognition and Lariel thought to herself, could this be of all coincidences in the world, could this be Tyrion's twin brother, of whom he spoke, who'd had the previous run-in with Ankari when they were younger? With a whispered word, the new mage managed to unbind the chains that had been all around Ankari at the time. Ankari seemed to almost instantaneously expand, and the Everqueen could sense the growth in the Greater Demon's power. What was this mage doing? This seemed to be absolute madness, as the Greater Demon gathered its strength and charged straight at this new mage. The mage lashed out again with another magical attack, again renewing the flames around the greater demon. And then suddenly, the reality around the greater demon began to bend and warp and wrinkle, and almost instantaneously, the greater demon disappeared from this world. Sensing he was no longer around, the Ever Queen could not believe it, and breathed a huge sigh of relief. The mysterious stranger went over to Tyrion, and the Everqueen went over to follow him. Tyrion, with some gasping, managed to get out the words, It's good to see you, brother, confirming the Everqueen's suspicions that this is his twin brother, Teclis. Hush, Teclis simply said, and with another magical word, put Tyrion to sleep. Teclis then turned to the Everqueen and said he's too stubborn to die, seemingly being able to read the concern on her face, which actually managed to surprise the Everqueen herself just how emotional she had been at the plight of Tyrion. And she simply looked at Teclis, smiled, and said, yes, he is. Over the next few hours, Teclis set about healing his brother using a combination of magic and maggots and all kinds of things to get his brother back up to health, and they simply allowed him to sleep for a time. Now, during that time, the Everqueen and Teclis were sort of sat around the campfire together, and Teclis is mostly brewing away on potions and things like that, but they get to talking a little bit, and the Everqueen just kind of pipes up and looks across him and says, uh, Teclis, you look a lot like your brother. Teclis is kind of taken aback, noting that it's very surprising that the Everqueen would say this, seeing as like nobody else thought they looked alike. And she said, maybe not in the face, but the way you look at me is very similar. Now, it seemed that Teclis was also not susceptible to the Everqueen's magics and had managed to avoid them, not falling for this spell, this aura of adoration she had around her. So the brothers were similar in that respect. Teclis seemed surprised to hear that he looked at the Everqueen kind of rudely, and they talk about how her and Tyrion first met. And he kind of says, oh, it's unusual that you uh, didn't like him. Women tend to like Tyrion. And without being able to help herself, the Everqueen mutters up with, 
lots of women with both a tone of jealousy and curiosity. Eventually, after a few days, Tyrion awoke, and the two of them began to banter like brothers do, Tyrion mocking Teclis's new hat, which he found amusing, which was the crown of Safari, and they're just talking about how Tyrion maybe had it in hand and he didn't need saving from his brother. You know, just boyish jostling like that. And so the three of them travel together to an area known as the Fenuvial Plains. And here they've kind of bumped into and they've told everyone to spread the word that the Ever Queen is alive. Now all over the whole of Ulfwan at this time, a massive Dark Elf invasion was occurring. People were dying left, right, and center. There was no real centralized army to take care of it. So they were spreading the word that everyone should try and get to this place, the Fenuvial Plains, and they try and regroup from there with the nobility of the island. And so groups of five or ten loose elves would hear about it. They'd get another five or ten. Scores would become hundreds. Hundreds would become thousands. And they all got to the Fenuvial Plain campsites, whereupon Teclis, Tyrion, and the Ever Queen eventually arrived after journeying together out of Avalon. Now, on the journey, the Ever Queen had tried to try and tap into her powers, get some advice from the other Ever Queens, just to understand how they should proceed and what they should do, and it was this kind of mustering of the forces that she decided on. Now, as soon as they get into camp, Tyrion announces that the Ever Queen is there and orders them all to kneel, which is a bit of a weird thing in the story to me, as he seemed to not like everyone kneeling and adoring her, but that's what happens. They all kneel when she lifts her hood everyone's like oh my god the ever queen and they all drop to their knees immediately falling both under the adoration and probably just the actual relief that the female ruler of Ulfwan is still alive and still going and they still have her magic on hand. More of a symbol of hope than anything else, really. So once she meets the adoring crowd, she's kind of jostled off into the war council tent where they have to decide on what to do. Now, most of the nobles advise retreat. We need to go pull out. We can get our army back together at another point and then have a counterattack versus the Dark Elves. Now, Tyrion has a look on his face, which the Ever Queen can see out the corner of her eye and simply ask him what he thinks. He goes into the idea that if we break now, there'll be no getting back together. We'll end up leaving civilian behind, they'll get killed, our army will fracture, and we'll never have an opportunity like this one again. Also, the Fenuvial Plains is an actually quite easily defendable position. I think was, they said there was a river on one side and cliffs on the other or something. It just allowed them to defend the terrain fairly well. Then the subject of the Witch King is brought up, the ruler of the Dark Elves. They're like, how are we going to deal with this guy? And Teclis tells and he pictures up and goes, I have an idea, guys, but I can't tell you in case one of you are his spies. So just trust me, I got this. Don't you worry. And everyone took that with a pinch of salt as well. That Teclis, that after six millennium of having the Witch King haunt their dreams, that suddenly this upstart young wizard suddenly had the solution to how to banish Malekith, the Witch King, whereas all others had failed. Eventually, they get to the point of decision, and the Ever Queen says, Right, enough is enough of discussion. What are you going to do? Are we going to stand or run? And I can tell you all one thing I will stay. But anyone who wants to go can go. That's my decision as the Ever Queen. And that kind of leads into an uproar. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they all suddenly just get wrapped up in the idea of the Ever Queen standing by them um, and allowing them to defend their homeland against these evil invaders. So after the meeting at the council, word goes through camp that Tyrion and Teclis' father's in camp and that he's brought the thing he'd been working on for a large portion of his life, which was restoring the armor of Anarion, the armor of the most legendary high elf who ever lived. Uh, his father had had it, also being a descendant from Anarion, like his sons, obviously. Um, but his father had always looked to restore it and spent much of his life trying to do so. And the idea was that at this crucial moment, his father had finished their project and brought the armor to the camp with him for Tyrion to try on. Now, his father was a bit apprehensive about, because Tyrion was the only one really with the warrior skill to pull it off in the family. And so his father's a bit apprehensive because he knows the curse of Anarion and Anarion's blood. And it's like, if I put this on, will he become like Anarion, as bloodthirsty and crazy as he turned in his latter years? Or is he actually going to be able to resist this kind of uh, aspect of the armor? The idea being that it will tempt you into bloodlust because it's part of Anarion himself almost. 
So there's this discussion about whether he should wear it or not, and his father kind of leaves him to the idea. Now, the Ever Queen gets wind of this discussion going on, and she goes to visit him to talk to him about it. Having had a number of disagreements with Tyrion over the course of their journey about his killing and his self-admitted uh, like of killing, he enjoys what he does. They have this chat, and he's like, I'm worried, I don't know if I should put on this armor. And she goes into his tent, and she simply says, so what are you thinking in regards to the armor? And he explains that he doesn't know if he should put it on. He knows his weaknesses. He's aware of the aspects of his personality that are similar to his descendants, Narian. And he doesn't want to become the next Anarian. And she simply says to him, you're not an Arian. You have his grace, his martial ability, but you have none of his cruelty and despair. So don't worry, Tyrion. You can wear this armor. I believe in you. I know you can do this. At that point, they hold hands and they sort of start to bring each other closer together. And she says, look, I, I want you to wear this armor not for any, for the betterment of elfen kind or for this battle ahead but i want you to wear this armor so that you will come back to me and as she says that tears start to well up in her eyes and he simply says we've come a long way you and i and she simply looks at him and says let us hope we have a long way further to go in that moment their lips touch they get in close and they kiss for the first time and then in a very pg-13 way we kind of fade to black we have no idea what kind of shenanigans went on in the evening, nor what kind of nocturnal perambulations occurred. So in the morning, the sun rises. The Ever Queen is looking out over her army. Uh, she spots Tyrion in the crowd, kind of gives him a little wry smile, and she utters out to the army in front of her, My friends, we are gathered in very dark times. Our enemies are mighty, our allies few. We have suffered defeat after defeat and loss after loss. I would not blame any of you if you had lost all hope of eventual victory. At this point, the crowd are like, oh, this isn't much of a pep talk, is it? Nonetheless, you have not done so. You have not given up even in the face of a foe who delights in displaying his cruelty and power. You have not admitted defeat even in the face of overwhelming odds. You stand before me ready to fight and die for your homeland and that makes me proud of each and every one of you. I would not have been here to tell you this if it had not been for two brothers. They saved me from the servants of the Witch King, and they are here now to fight alongside you in battle tomorrow. I owe them my life, and I wish to repay them. Teclis, step forward. So Teclis kind of like taken a bit aback by this. He doesn't really like the adulation, but the crowd starts to roar his name. And it's kind of, you know, you can see the kind of pride. His chest kind of gets out a little bit. He starts to strut a little bit. And he comes up and she says... It had been said that you may turn out to be the greatest wizard ever since Kalidor, the guy who set up the Vortex initially. That's a side note for you guys. I truly hope this is the case, or we have, for we have need of great wizards today. As a token of my respect and esteem, I give you this staff. At which point she gives him the moon staff, which he picked up at the Winter Palace, which served to amplify Teclis' magic uh, a number of times over. She then turns back to the crowd, and says, if it was not for Teclis' brother Tyrion, I truly would not have been here today. He saved me from the midst of the Druki army, when all hope seemed lost, and he stayed with me until I found safety among you, despite taking terrible wounds from the poison blades of the followers of Malekith. And she kind of gestures towards him and towards this wagon. Now in the wagon is the armor of Anarian, and he has decided to don it. So he puts it on in front of the whole crowd. It's a huge crowd pleaser. Loads of people are kind of taken aback because of all the images of Anarian they've had. Tyrion is just the spitting image. So with the armor, with his sword, it kind of just looks like the Anarian of old. Um, so they're kind of like buzzed by that, but also a little bit cautious. Now from her sort of vantage point, she can see that not only is he putting on the armor, but the prince of, I think it's the princes of Yvres come over and they offer Tyrion a horse, which is Malhindia, his ride, his now famous ride. And so that's the first time he gets his horse as well. And then that really kind of concludes the psyching up speech. Everyone's just cheering. He has his horse, he has a sword. He looks just like Anarian, the legendary hero of old. Teclis is a great wizard with a cool new staff. The crowd's really pump let's go to war and the dark elf army at this point had emerged on the two the plains and the two armies get just outside of bow range of one another 
Now, a whole bunch of stuff happens within this battle. There's a couple of challenges. Um, a couple of guys step forward. They get killed by the guy who killed the Everqueen, Urien Poisonblade, who's kind of a double agent and be living amongst the High Elves for a long time. Uh, he's challenged by, uh, he sort of puts out a challenge like, go on, show me your best champion. Uh, two guys go up, they basically get killed. Tyrion eventually goes up because the Ever Queen had been holding him back out of concern. And if he ever got like cut down in front of all the troops, it would just be a complete mer killer for morale. So she held him back, but eventually went up and he manages to defeat Poison Blade. And then that just triggers the huge charge. Both sides clash. It's a battle of the ages. Teclas is having a magical duel with Malekith over the course of the battle. He eventually levitates away from the side of the Ever Queen, kind of hovering above the battle, and takes on Malekith one on one in a magical duel. Now, what Teclas's plan eventually was is if you've seen my Tyrion and Teclas video uh, for more details on their side of this story, check the top right hand corner now. Um, you will know that he kind of awoke the flames of Asurian from the time that Malekith tried to make himself the Phoenix King. Now, to become the Phoenix King, you have to bathe yourself in the fire in this particular shrine, uh, the Shrine of Asurian. He got horribly burnt by it, and everyone took this as a sign that he wasn't selected as the Phoenix King by the gods of the High Elves. And so... Teclas taps into this latent energy within Malekith and sets him on fire again from the inside. Now Malekith is in terrible pain, he starts screaming out, and then he just disappears. Now, Alariel, Teclas don't really know what happened to him, but we know as an outsider that he disappeared into the warp. Eventually, he did come back a few years later, back in Nagaroth, but it took him a while to get out of there, and he was being hunted down by Inkari the whole time. He was trying to get revenge for being used by Malekith as a tool to move his armies around the battlefield. Anyway, that was the Battle for Nuvial Plains, where the High Elves eventually won the day, they got rid of Malekith for a while, they drove off the Dark Elves, they saved their homeland, and it was really the birth of the Lariel as the Ever Queen. Now, during the Battle of Fenuvial Plain, she was not a force to be reckoned with, but she still, unlike many Ever Queens of the past, inspired the troops in battle, was their talisman as they charged into the Dark Elves, was their rallying point as well. Now, this was looked upon kind of badly by a number of, let's say, the old-fashioned, more traditionalist High Elves. It'd be kind of like the Pope giving a battle line speech and then encouraging Encouraging everyone to charge in and kill each other. It'd be kind of unusual, but this is an Ever Queen who was born in the fires of war, and that's how she kind of continued on. So as the years followed from the Fenuvial Plain, she completed the rituals to the Ever Queen. She became increasingly more powerful. At this point, she's really able to heal every any kind of wound. If that wound that Tyrion sustained happened sort of later on today, towards the start of the Total War Warhammer timeline, she'd be able to click her fingers, done heal wound dealt with she can also living anti-corruption in a way undead she can unbind them from their master's grasp causing them just to collapse as bodies on the floor uh, chaos she gets bonuses when fighting them she can banish demons with a touch and she has access to three laws of magic uh, life light and high magic all of which we've seen in total war warhammer and she's managed to master all of these now because she has not a stranger to warfare not a stranger to learning how to deal with things herself even when she was powerless at her most vulnerable she decided not to be a victim she decided to stand up for herself and take it from there and this led her to kind of go on to not be afraid to lead out hosts of high elf armies on her own to fight the enemies of the high elves perhaps the most famous example of this came some 30 years after the Battle of the Fenuvial Plains when she'd really start to come into the power in her own right and a demon host had emerged in the Amuli Mountains in Ulfwan uh, and they kind of ravaged eastward into Safari and they started to cause all kinds of trouble um, and they started to sort of killing everything and they kind of came onto this area of Ulfwan that had the highest concentration of waystones. Now waystones are a key thing. We've seen them with the Wood Elves, we've seen them with High Elves. Waystones Stones are kind of things that help contain chaos magic. They help keep the vortex going. So whenever you see chaos -y inspired guys, uh, much like uh, we saw with Grom the Ponch, the Greenskin, when he made the first Greenskin invasion of Ulfwan, he was kind of led by chaos gods, kind of getting him to destroy Waystones. And so these chaos demons were trying to destroy Waystones as well. So the Ever Queen led out an army against them, and they just clashed. It was a horrific battle. Flesh hounds were tearing apart 
Hart spearmen, Furies dive down, Reavers were peppering them with bows and arrows, riding them down, Shadow Warriors were killing everything they could get their hands on, it was just chaotic, really. And the battle started to almost turn against the High Elves. They were really getting down, and the Ever Queen seems to focus a lot, and suddenly this mist descends on the battlefield, and it's kind of a rejuvenating mist for all the High Elves present. They feel like they have these hands in the mist lifting them up if they were down on the ground. They could swear to God that they saw sort of dead relatives, dead past warriors on the battlefield with them, helping them strike down these Chaos Demons. And the Waystones are around in the mist started to shine a hugely bright white and just caused like massive beacons lit up the whole battlefield and so in this magical mist the high elf army was uplifted was recovering from any wounds they had and they managed to fight on absolutely annihilating the army of demons in front of them as the army of demons lay dying the mist started to lift and all their comrades lost in days gone by disappeared along with the mist as well but to this day any veteran of that battle will swear on Isha herself that their fallen comrades were there to aid them that day brought about people suspect by the magic of the ever queen so she has gone on to lead many more uh, campaigns from that. Her romance with Tyrion is thought to have continued to this day, although that in itself is quite controversial, as the Ever Queen is expected to at least have a child with the Phoenix King, and that will go on to be the next Ever Queen. So years later, it's thought that maybe Ilariel succumbed to this sort of pressure of the social system and did give birth to a daughter by the name of Alfara. And this brings us dangerously close to the end times and delving too much into Alifara, but let's just say there's maybe a question mark about her parents, but she does still keep Tyrion as a hot piece on the side, and thus the sort of romantic element, and why we may be suspected that this could be if everything was on schedule and CA didn't maybe have so much on their plates, would have been quite a fitting uh, Valentine's Day DLC. But alas, that was not to be. So in terms of her rules on the tabletop and some of the skills we might see translated over to Total War Warhammer, she has the rule known as the Boon of Isha, which means that any unit she's placed in uh, has a magic attack and is immune to fear and terror, so immune psychology. Now that might take two forms, it might just make her immune to fear and terror, they could do it in ways of a banner, or they could just make it an aura effect, and I think they'll probably go with the aura effect on her for the boon of Isha. The next one is Chaos Bane, and this is just the idea that if you have a demonic thing, that they take damage just being around her. The idea is that if you're Chaos and around her, it affects her negatively in terms of her casting, but she damages Chaos Demons just by being around them. This is that whole sort of give and take with her and Chaos Corruption, that Chaos Corruption weakens her, but she's very effective against Chaos Corruption, and that's how the rule translated on the tabletop. So a demonic aura effect, that might be translated just to Chaos and Norska forces, uh, but we'll see what Creative Assembly do with that. The other one is simply the touch of the Ever Queen, the idea that she can banish demons with touch. And what this does, I think, is just give her a killing blow. Uh, so that will we've seen that in Total War Warhammer series already. In terms of her items, she has the Shield Stone, which is an a stone that's believed to be as old as Ulfwan itself, and the only person who's known to be able to use this stone is the Ever Queen and all the other Ever Queens that have passed. Now, it's as old, it's thought to be as old as the Ever Queens are, which remember predate the idea of the Phoenix King. So, a very ancient stone that gives her on the tabletop five plus ward saves. So, that would be a 33% ward save, but we probably wouldn't be that high in terms of War Warhammer, at least to begin with, but that would be one of her magic items. And her next magic item is something known as the Star of Avalon, and that's something known as a diadem, uh, which has a single gem in it, and it was thought to be a gift from Anarian to his first wife, the Ever Queen, and it's said to be a star itself that was bound by the goddess Isha and transformed into this gem. Now, the idea is this is a healing item, and it would be able to heal a single wound on a unit with nearby to the Ever Queen, uh, but it'll just maybe have a healing aura effect in terms of Warhammer, or be like um, well, some of the spells and stuff we've seen where 
where she can cast it a certain amount of times and it heals nearby units within range. The next item she has is the uh, Stave of Avalon and that is an heirloom that all ever queens go around with. Um, it's one use and what it did on the tabletop was allow you to cast a spell twice within a magic phase. So on the tabletop you could you'd have different spells that you'd roll for uh, randomly to get them assigned per your law of magic but this allowed you to cast the same spell twice in a turn which was hugely beneficial. Now what this might mean effect is that once you get this item a cool little thing they could do for Total War Warhammer would be is once she has this item that spells can just keep being there's no cooldown for her spells and she can just keep casting them as long as she has winds of magic. That would be a cool little effect and kind of speak to her power as a mage as well. I kind of like that idea. I think that would be a good implementation of her uh, in Total War Warhammer. Now, she also has a couple of unique items that can only be used by armies uh, that she has control over. So, these are items not for her, but for the armies within her group. Now, we probably won't see this directly translated, although it would be cool to see her start of these two items uh, that she can assign to armies under her control. But the first item is something known as the Horn of Isha which is a single pearl white seashell. And this gives a bonus to uh, the ability to hit uh, both in melee and missile attacks. So that's what the Horn of Isha does. And the next one is the Banner of Avalon. And that's made of living leaves. It's quite a cool idea for a banner. And it's sort of sewed together with the hairs of the handmaiden troops themselves. Uh, so the queen's special forces. Uh, so that's quite a cool little aspect. So sewed together with hair of living leaves. And each new Ever Queen gets a new one built for her over time. So if an Ever Queen dies, she's buried with that banner. In fact, it becomes her funeral shroud. And then the next Ever Queen gets a new one built for her. But what this does is effectively allow the Ever Queen to better target a unit with magic. So it would give her a higher chance to get off a spell that had sort of a healing ability and that unit would heal more than it normally would. Now, this is a very tricky one to translate into War Warhammer and... I'm not exactly sure how they're going to do it. They could give it as a banner, of course, but maybe make it as a banner designed around um, an aura effect that boosts casting ability or power recovery rate to give the idea that this is a unit that will stand right next to the Ever Queen and boost her magic recovery rate so she can cast more spells. That would be kind of a fun implementation as a banner uh, for her, and that unit would have to work in close conjunction with her. But that's about it for the Ever Queen Alariel, guys. Hope that sheds some light on you. The Ever Queen, who's not afraid to be very different from the Ever Queens of past, an Ever Queen uniquely born in battle, and who will go on to lead the elves to victories, I'm sure. All right, guys, as always, hope you enjoyed that, and I hope to catch you all on the next one. All right, guys, bye.